there has been a party going on all season long on the West Coast. And the Pac-12 the last couple of years, has the reputation been amazing? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Like, they haven't really put teams consistently in the college football playoff, and it is what it is. And so this is the last year of the Pac-12 as we know it. Both these teams will be in new conferences here sooner rather than later. Oregon to the Big Ten, Utah to the Big 12. But they're going to they're gonna keep on partying before they turn the lights off. They're playing arguably the best brand of football is the Pac-12 in the entire college football landscape. So we got 3.30 Eastern on Fox, Oregon at Utah, Oregon, favored by right around a touchdown. I mentioned that time, 3.30 Eastern. If you want to add in some caffeine just for the pure nostalgia of Pac-12 After Dark, be my guest. No caffeine required for this one. So no caffeine special out there on the West Coast. So we appreciate them for that. For Oregon, man, it is fight or flight mode. They want to win the Pac-12. They want to make the college football playoff. You got one loss now. The mulligan is gone. You go to Salt Lake City in a tough spot against a tough physical football team coming off a very big win over USC is Utah. How do you respond? I think this is potentially... And our good friend Jay Hop from Scoop Duck echoed this sentiment on the Roundtable channel for On3 yesterday, and it it, uh, came out this morning. This is potentially the most difficult game left on Oregon's schedule the rest of the regular season by nature of how things have developed in Los Angeles. So for Oregon now, mission is the same. Like I said, fight or flight mode for them when it comes to their college football playoff and Pac-12 title aspirations. Utah feels like they just got some new juice with that win in LA and it felt like it was a huge reminder for the rest of the country that oh yeah that's that's the back-to-back Pac-12 champs that's the team that took USC to the woodshed in the Pac-12 title game on a Friday night last season it looks different sure Cam Rising he's not out there on the field he's on the sideline he's not gonna play the rest of the season yeah I understand that Bryson Barnes playing quarterback for you but it's that same brand of Utah football we've come to expect from Kyle Whittingham. I said this right after they beat USC at my Twitter page, at Jody Pakel. I said, I don't think there is remotely a percentage chance that Kyle Whittingham ever leaves Utah from where I'm standing. But there's a lot of schools that would be, one, lucky to have him, and two, would like to have him, I'm sure, with uh, some potential vacancies across the country. With that being said, they're 100% behind Bryson Barnes. Kyle Whittingham has this thing rolling again. I think he's very happy in Salt Lake City. And this would be another signature win should they find a way to take down Oregon. Both teams very physical in this game. Both like to play in the trenches. Both do great running the football. Both do great stopping the run. So when it comes to a matchup of sorts for me, I'm curious how Oregon does on the perimeter and how Utah defends Oregon's perimeter game in this matchup. Oregon averaging 6.2 yards a carry, number one in the country. Utah allowing less than three yards a carry. Good for top 15, top 20 in the country. Now, Oregon's rush total is so high, they run at that yards per carry number because they do a great job getting defenses off balance. A big way they do that, to go back to the point of this bullet point, they do a great job putting the ball on the edge and making defenses run sideline to sideline. And then once they get you off balance, they do a great job going north and south. That's who Oregon is. That's who they have been. So if Oregon gets in a rhythm and they get that defense flowing, we're going to see what we've seen from Oregon. Bo Nix dropping back to pass, loosening up the wing, no pun intended because they're the Ducks, and he's just dropping bombs. He's throwing missiles. There's big plays happening. The other side of that could also be in the run game. If the defense starts flowing, get a linebacker running to the sideline, that's great. We got inside zone going the other way. Bucky Irving sounds like he's back healthy for this one. He's a problem when he gets rolling downhill. The reason why I talk about the perimeter game is because I could very easily see the trenches being a stalemate with how good Utah is and how good Oregon is. So I think it could be a horizontal game to go vertical if you're Oregon, whether it's running or passing. So how Utah defends that is crucial. Because to be real now, we haven't seen Oregon be in a spot where they don't have the run game. And again, I think the, per- the perimeter pass game, perimeter run game sets up that run game north and south. But if Utah does a good job on the edges of this Oregon offense and it becomes a game in a phone booth where Utah is able to kind of just hunker down and, and, and be able to get after that Oregon run game and take that away, we haven't seen Oregon in that spot just yet. That would be new territory for Oregon. And I promise you, that is not a spot you want to be in in a raucous Salt Lake City against a physical, rock-solid identity outfit 
of Utah. You don't want to have to figure it out in that spot. That's where things could get very, very intriguing. Something else I'm watching in this game now. A name to know, and a name that you probably already know because you're a college football junkie and because you probably enjoy football games that go around at 1030 Eastern, Sione Vaki for Utah. If you Googled him right now, he would come up as a safety playing for Utah. Uh, he does play safety, but he has been just the, the, the jumper cables, if you will, to that Utah offense. They have found a way to get him the football in space. He's been a wildcat for them, playing, playing running back and, and being in that quarterback position rather in the wildcat sort of formation. He's been a problem in the pass game. Just ask USC about that. He's been a weapon for them. He has breathed life into this Utah offense. So for Oregon now, the second level of that defense, especially the linebackers, they're going to have a very, very big assignment this upcoming weekend trying to defend him because the Wildcat offense is so tricky to defend. A couple of reasons. I'll go through them really quick. First, you more often than not have a motion going with it. It's, a, it's an option for that running back playing quarterback. So whatever decision you make, typically you're wrong. If you want to rush outside with that jet sweep, well, we're going to run the ball right up at you. If you want to sit on that running back playing quarterback, sit on the Wildcat quarterback and try and make sure he doesn't hurt you, well, they have a chance then to give it and circle the defense. The other part of this is you add in a blocker whenever you have the Wildcat offense. Because think about it this way. When you're a quarterback in a normal offense, you're not blocking anybody. Like you just hand the ball off and most times you're watching or you're giving a, a play action look or whatever. But when you have the Wildcat offense, quarterback's running the football who is, again, already a running back at this point in time. So we have an extra blocker, or at the very least, some more window dressing with that jet sweep going on to where you have less numbers defensively to account for the blockers that Utah has. So with that out of the way, going to be very important for Oregon in that second level, those linebackers, to play really fundamentally sound. If you get outside of your gap at all, that's all Sione Vaki needs to get north and south and to create some explosive plays for this Utah offense. Also going to be important for this third level of the Oregon defense to really swarm, especially when they go sideline to sideline. Now, you don't want to swarm too much and overcompensate, and that's something to watch here. Does Oregon overcompensate when it comes to Sione Vaki and he's kind of the decoy, and then Bryson Barnes gets an easy downfield throw to whoever you want to insert there? Something to watch for. But if Oregon's able to defend Sione Vaki and he doesn't start cooking, well, then you put the game back on Bryson Barnes. Bryson Barnes, now, to be fair, played really well against USC. Probably had the best game of his season against USC. Was good enough to win. Had a game-winning scramble to set up that field goal. Like, he played awesome. Over the course of the season, though, he's completing less than 60% of his passes, four touchdowns, three picks. If you had to pick a way, or you had to pick a player, rather, to beat you if you're Oregon, I think you would pick Bryson Barnes. But again, if you can't stop Sione Vaki, Tie up those laces, buckle that chin strap because we got to track me. And you ask Oregon to match scores on the road in a raucous environment against a tough defense. Like, I don't think you really want to live that way if you're Oregon. Here's the big question for me. We talk about it a lot on this show because I think it's extra important when it comes to the collegiate game. And that's all we talk about here. So that's a good deal for us. Whose emotional tank is better positioned in this football game? Because Utah, after that emotional win over USC, we saw it this past weekend with Washington and with Oklahoma and with Texas, all three teams coming off emotional games that didn't play their best football the next week. It's very tough to hit the reset button, especially when you have 18 to 22-year-olds that, oh, by the way, also have to go to class and have to juggle school along with being a Division I collegiate athlete. Okay, so there's that part of it, for Utah at least. How do they respond to the big win over USC? Are they able to hit the reset button and play their best ball at home against a really good Oregon team? Going to need it. For Oregon, they had that close loss to Washington on the road, three-point loss, you miss a field goal. Everyone's questioning Dan Lanning going on fourth down. We already said we love that here. Go for it. Live how you live, Dan Lanning. Uh, they beat Washington State last week. My question, though, Oregon really hasn't had a break. Like, there was no bye week that was there to save Oregon after that Washington game. Very emotional, draining game, you would imagine, if you're in Eugene. Great win over Washington State, who I thought was sneaky to begin with. But now you go back on the road and you play, again, I keep saying this, but like gritty, physical, whatever verbiage you want to throw at Utah, they are exactly that. And then some, it's going to test you. It's going to push you, push you to, uh, to the limit a little bit. Now, 
I'm going to pick Oregon to win this football game, and here's why. I think Oregon is battle-tested, and I think we've seen them over the course of Dan Lanning's time there have a great response every single week, regardless of what happened the week before. He does a great job getting that team focused up. I'm not saying Kyle Whittingham doesn't, but I'm saying I trust the veteran experience here with Oregon when it comes to Bo Nix leading that operation, when it comes to Dan Lanning getting his team ready to play. Teams take on the persona. If you've watched the show for a length of time, you know what I'm saying. Teams take on the persona of their leadership. Dan Lanning, I think he is tough as it comes as a head coach, and I think they get their team ready to play. I think there's also, to be fair, schematically, more ways for Oregon to win this football game than Utah. I think if Oregon needs to throw the football, they can throw the football. If Oregon has to make it a rock fight, they have to run the ball, I think they can do that as well. Probably a little bit better than a lot of people would like to think. So we'll take Oregon to win. I'm going to put the score at 33-24. I wouldn't touch the spread. I wouldn't. I understand Oregon's getting a touchdown. They're at Utah. That, to me, is fishy. Spider senses going off. Do not touch the spread, in my humble opinion. We put out our best bets every single week exclusively on my Instagram page, at JD Paquel. You will not find Oregon at Utah on there. I promise you that. Now, a win for Oregon would mean another hurdle cleared, would mean you continue to keep those college football playoff aspirations alive. And I think it'd be, it would be a big confidence booster as well. I don't think they need a ton of confidence in Eugene, but to get a win on the road against a team that has been the class of the Pac-12 the last couple of years, I think that would go a long way for them in terms of proving even more so internally who they are. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for watching. Subscribe to the channel here to make sure you don't miss an episode of The Hard Count. Also, be sure to check out other videos on the On3 YouTube channel.